Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ed Beat. I'm April Cummings from Cayman Life TV. And of course, this is Patrick Brendel from Cayman Current. Good morning, April. You didn't show people you were singing and dancing in the background there when the beautiful Ed Beat fancy open stinger thing was playing. I saw that. Okay, it's not Morse code, but close enough. So we have stuff to discuss today. Exciting stuff, actual. That's true. <laughs> and we have a special guest. Very excited about this. Patrick, why do you not introduce our guest this morning while I push the button that makes her appear on screen magically? Well, as um, our regular viewers and readers of the Cayman Current are probably aware of, this Friday, 18th March, are um, the Cayman Current's first in-depth multimedia project, which is a documentary series called Island Jobs. Uh, the subject is TVET and STEM education in Cayman. Well, the first episode of this series is going to be a part of the Cayman Documentary Festival, uh, which is taking place at uh, Cayman Bay Cinema uh, later on this week. So kind of the first glimpse of something I say we've been working hard on, but mostly <laughs> Kayla down there has been working hard on, is uh, we get the first glimpse on Friday evening. So Kayla Young is a Cayman Current journalist, and she spent many months, uh, several months, between several and many, multiple months. Uh, many months. Lots of people, <laughs> employers, um, educators, uh, importantly, um, young Caymanians, um, about this topic of TVET and STEM education. And so she is officially the reporter. Uh, she reported, uh, wrote, and directed uh, Island Job. So we brought Kayla on to um, talk more in detail about uh, what we, you know, what is something that's really exciting for us to be able to show uh, to the public. So hi, Kayla. Hi, thanks for having me on, having me back after uh, on the other end of this project. <laughs> yes. Um, and we, be, we would be amiss if we didn't mention that uh, our own April Cummings is the narrator of this series. So thank you very much, April, for, for being a part of this was, as well. I'm very proud of the whole thing. It's as though I actually worked my tail off, which I did not. That's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a really exciting project. What was it like? Um, I mean, it, it's one thing to do a singular Store, news story or news feature yeah. on a subject, but this is much more intensive. Um, what was yeah. this whole process like for you? Uh, it was interesting. I got to step into a side of education that I wasn't traditionally a part of uh, because we're looking at primarily at, at TVET. And of course, since I love school, STEM has become a conversation. Um, you know. I, but I, um, stepping into those vocational courses, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, they're active classes. Um, you know, we've got some clips where, you know, the guys are joking around in class. And, and so it was actually a, a really fun uh, series to, to shoot and to hear about. I mean, one of the questions we try to is, you know, what is the job market like for young Caymanians here? And so we got to hear a lot about their perspectives. I feel like that's one of the more important, one of the more significant parts of the series to take away is, okay, what are people saying about um, how their educational opportunities line up with the job market? Um, are we providing young Caymanians with the right foundation, the right skill sets, so that they can actually compete for the jobs that we have on island? Um, so we explore that concept throughout the series. The um, episode, as Patrick mentioned, will be at a documentary festival this Friday at Cinema. Uh, we are showing right after The Great Disconnect, which is a documentary about social media and the way that um, technology has uh, increased a sense of isolation. And um, so we'll show right after after that and uh, tickets are $25 um, if listeners would like to come out and uh, show some support there uh, and then after we'll have a panel discussion 
and uh, kind of pulling topics together, uh, which I. So Kayla's audio dropped out for a little bit there, Patrick. Um, she was talking and about she the panel. She turned sideways. I know. <laughs> just I didn't mention it yet, but I was not yeah. going to be able to resist. Yeah, we had so some fa fancy just... camera work, uh, not in the documentary. Yeah. Although, so what, you know, Kayla, what Kayla cool. was referring to is, uh, so on Friday evening, 6.30, buy your tickets on Fandango. The, um, they're going to be showing this North American documentary called The Great Disconnect. And then there'll be a, a shorter inter intermission. Then they're going to show our episode of Island Jobs. And then Kayla will be moderating a panel discussion, uh, which I believe I believe this is sponsored or featuring the Alex Panton Foundation. And the topic is going to be mental health. And they're, we're going to tie that into, um, you know, uh, young people's mental health and education. So... So we're looking forward to that. And I know Kayla, in addition to the documentary, has gotten the, the panel on her plate. And um, if you've ever moderated a panel or participated in one, you know that it's that it does involve a lot of preparation uh, to make sure that that goes through. Um, it's not it's not just uh, wrangling uh, different speakers on the panel. You have you have to know what you're talking about. That is true. And forgive the dog who may be barking in the background because some guy just drove by on the road. So panel discussion provides a great opportunity to really engage about the subject. Um, we did mention last week that the um, that this is you know one component of the entire series, and that we're not going to be airing the entire series until the entire series can be aired together. So this is really kind of a unique opportunity to get a glimpse of what lies ahead. Yes, exactly. So when, when we're finished with the documentary, it's going to be, um, we kind of cut it into, I say, TV half hour chunks, mm -hmm. uh, which in the TV world is more closer to 20, 25 minutes. So each episode is going to be about 20 to 25 minutes long. Uh, when it's finished, we'll have five episodes that all tie in together, and uh, which makes it a series. And then um, we'll also have, which I'm excited about, because uh, I'm, I'm vain like this, uh, the 90 minute feature length cut, uh, which I think is going to be something really special. And um, so as you said, we'll, we'll show this first episode at the documentary festival. If you miss it, tough luck. Uh, the rest <laughs> so of the harsh. series is still in post-production right now with the studio, Silver Palm Studio. Um, so when everything's done, I hope, the hope is that we're able to host a, an event, a standalone event premiering uh, the 90 minute length film. And at, at, that, at that time, at that point, then we're gonna look to airing uh, the individual episodes as a series in multiple avenues, including uh, online, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Cayman Current website, Cayman Life TV, uh, and of course the Cayman Life TV ch cable channel. Very excited about the opportunity to do this. So Kayla, we had to um, um, have you have you come go in and come back out. We did touch a little bit on the subject of your panel, um, which was great. But um, is there are there any sort of big takeaways from working on the series you wanted to share with folks before we before we go? I get I lost not now I have lost audio. Is it me? Let's just check and make sure all the buttons are pushed. Now, Kayla's internet is fighting with her. We see her, but we cannot hear her. Patrick, perhaps you could imagine what Kayla is saying. And yeah. Say, or, yeah, or I I never heard of the time I've been the <laughs> All right, Kayla, your internet's back, but your audio um, might need to be tweaked to get you back on. So we'll keep chatting for a minute and to see if it will work for you. Um, I think there's like a little microphone looking button that or under your settings that will tell you which audio source you're using. I, I sound so technically adept right now because I have done this to myself many times. All right. But we are seeing you. That is good. Okay. All right, Patrick, in the meantime, while Kayla's working on her thing, yeah. <laughs> and if Kayla does not make it back, it is through no fault of her own. The internet is not being kind to her today. <laughs> have been there. Not. 
The internet. <laughs> very good, Patrick. Very good. All right. So anything else we want to talk about on the subject? I was just interested in sort of what Kayla, um, I, both the experiences covering it from a reporter producer standpoint, but also just if there was sort of any big um, takeaways that she might have um, gotten from the, you know, from the series. Um, I'm going to bring her back in one more time. Just I'm, I'm a sucker for punishment. No, oh, she left. She left me. Her left me. So, um, but I mean, you've been just, you know, no need to downplay your own involvement. You've been just as involved as Kayla has throughout the process. Is there anything that you've seen from it? And I don't want you to give away the whole story, but um, any takeaways that you think, you know, will be of interest to folks? Well, for me, um, the big thing is, as Kayla mentioned, uh, we started off really with a list of questions because people talk a lot. You know, for me, TVET has TVET education has been something that I hear about roughly once every four years during the political campaigns to the point when somebody talks uh, about the need or enhancing or even accomplishments in TVET, uh, you can Google that and find remarks uh, to that point from four years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, but the reality for me is it was a, is a big zone of ignorance for me personally. So really had a list of questions going from the, from the very highest level down to the singular level from things like uh, are the provisions that we have in place or being planned um, adequate to meet the, um, the demands of the workforce? And by, by the way, what are workforce demands for Cayman's economy? And then all the way down to the minute detail, which is honestly, what, what kind of courses and classes are available? <laughs> How do you get funding for them? And um, is this resulting in actual jobs? So Kayla's really taken this list of questions, called and talked to just about anybody either of us could think of, and gotten to um, really boil that down and organized it into, uh, you know, I think is a cohesive and compelling narrative. And, um, you know, it's really, really difficult to do. But Hi, it makes Kayla, it easy at the end. I think we have Hi, you can back. can you hear me now? Yes, and see you. Yay! Okay, just a few technical glitches on my end today. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if Patrick's making that face um, for fun or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or if he's stuck like like this way. Yeah. This is just how, this is just um, how he looks. But yeah, I guess stepping back to your question earlier about takeaways from this uh, series. I, something I found that um, I heard from many different young Caymanians is how important mentorship was to them in finding their professional path. Uh, how, you know, just having an older person, someone who's established to guide them, let them, uh, you know, someone who believes in them helps them figure out, okay, what are your skills? Um, what is it that's a good fit for you? Um, that's really powerful. And we have some examples of different programs, different um, educational opportunities where young people have found that mentor or found that um, footing on their path. So, you know, of course, uh, we have Michael Miles from Inspire, and you can't talk about TVET without talking about Michael Miles. Um, he was someone who really steps up and um, tries to to not just teach the skill sets, but teach, okay, what does it take to be a good professional? What does it take to succeed? You know, those those little things like, or big things rather, like showing up on time, dressing for the job, um, having that right attitude, navigating the curveballs that life throws us and still getting the job done, you know? Um, and so something that I see that would be really powerful is to really step up those mentorship opportunities, um, connect more young Caymanians with professionals in the field that they're interested in to show them that, you know, there is a pathway um, and we can help you find it. It's interesting because I, um, you know, I have had a comparable experience personally in my life a few times. And um, something similar also with one of my sons who really wasn't sure what he wanted to do, but he participated in the uh, mentorship came program as a student yeah. and it completely helped. 
I think because it wasn't his parents telling him what he should or shouldn't be doing. He was able to find mm. a path to a career choice that I would never have picked for him, for example. But turns out yeah. it seems to be a really good fit. And, um, yeah. you know, just having that adult experienced person talk with you and help you work through mm -hmm. um, your ideas of who you could, you know, what you could do and, you know, what options there are you might not even have thought of. I, I agree. Exactly. That's incredibly powerful. Yeah, it, exactly. And, you know, another theme that came up is um, the stigma around hands-on vocations that still exists. Um, this perception that um, I think has been you know, promoted over many generations, not just in Cayman, but in many places that office type of work is, is going to be a better path for you. You know, let, you know, pushing kids to go into finance, go into banking, um, those types of jobs that, okay, they're, that, that's a stable pathway, but it might not be the right fit for everyone. So let's also open our minds as the you know the established professionals mentors parents and envision okay maybe the pathways that were appropriate when i was younger starting off are different now for these young people let's help them dream of the many different options that are out there for them they don't just have to go into banking and finance to be successful to make good money you know there are a lot of jobs in the construction sector, a lot of jobs in, um, you know, we talked to Cayman Career Academy about jobs in the beauty sector and that, you know, these are pathways that, okay, if that's your fit, you can, you can do it well. Um, you know, it, it, something that Michael Miles brought up about one of his daughters is that she works in the hospitality sector. Um, and it's like, okay, if you're going to work in hospitality, you be the best at that position. Um, and, you know, young Caymanians are in a position where they can dream of becoming the person who owns the business, of becoming the boss, of building up and actually being an entrepreneur in their community. Um, so that's something else to consider, you know? Cool. Yeah, I think it's, uh, to me, it's very interesting when they show... Um, like organizational chart or industry charts and they have different entry points and people think about this a lot when you're talking about the white collar jobs like i'm going to go work for a bank i'm going to be an accountant you don't say i'm going to be an accountant and doing audit and for the next 50 years i'm going to be a junior associate doing audit mm -hmm. no what you say is okay in three years i'll do this then in five years and eventually i can be a consultant i can be a partner in the firm I can get and use my skills to get in all sorts of other areas. Well, the same thing is true for somebody who says, I want to be a mechanic. So I want to be a mechanic and I work on cars. Well, you build up a specialty in a certain, whether it's a certain brand of car, a certain component of the system, you can go into sales, you can go into um, management, you can become an outside consultant, a freelance mechanic, you can start your own business. There's lots of things you can do um, once you get in the door of almost any industry and start developing that yeah. specialized uh, skill set. Yeah, yeah. And it can be hard to envision, okay, what are all the different aspects of this industry when you're first starting off, right? Um, and uh, yeah, if we can encourage, you know, greater exploration of what do these different sectors mean? Um, and something, um, you know, one issue that we run into in this series with um, you know, actually building up, getting to the top um, is in some of these professions, we do have an issue where local educational opportunities um, hit a ceiling that, okay, I can become, I can take level one, level two in this trade, but if I want to go beyond that, um, there might not be another local course to access. So I think that's another um, question, another issue to address coming out of this is, okay, when we have young people who have skill in these trades and they want to grow, how do we help them reach that next level? Um, if the courses are off island, are we providing the scholarships for them to go off island? Should there be the courses on island? And are we pursuing making that possible? Um, something we hear from 
Phoenix Construction, for example, is, you know, they've got guys who they've trained up to a certain point and they want to go higher, but they don't have that pathway. Um, and so I think that's something else that is worth exploring more after this series is, okay, how do we establish the structures so that we can propel um, Caymanian workers to the next level if that's where they want to go? Awesome. I muted myself because my dog was barking. Apologies. That's fine. No, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a barky dog in the back too who's <laughs> behaving for the moment. <laughs> so, I mean, you raised some really interesting points too for further exploration. So hopefully we can have Island Jobs 2, season 2. I, yeah. We hope, you know, that there'll be, um, because, you know, there are discussions happening constantly about TVET and vocational education. Um, there's a few uh, new possibilities in the works right now, and fingers crossed that'll be some um, follow-up where we can show, okay, um, here's how some of these conversations actually turned into action that is beneficial for young Caymanians. That's, that's the hope, right? Awesome. We're hoping so, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Patrick, any um, last words before we switch to our other two topics? I do. Got it. So I will say I will share a little bit of exciting news that um, you don't know about April that that on, happened on Friday afternoon is um, we were able to reach an agreement with uh, local musician Stuart Wilson to feature uh, one of his songs as part of the documentary soundtrack. And um, I, this is really important to me. Uh, Stuart's a great guy. I've known him a long time. I have a lot of respect for him. And he's a, a local... Caymanian musician, musician with with the local songs, everything on island here, and I think I think Stewart's music really sets the tone uh, for the project. So I was really pleased uh, for this to be able to work out, and I wanted to say thank you to Stewart because he gave us really favorable terms for the use of his music, uh, considering that we're a nonprofit organization. So just wanted to give a little shout out and a thank you for that. Um, because I think one thing that I want to stress about Island Jobs is uh, we did it here. We did it on Island. We're talking to local folks. We're using a local production studio. We have a local narrator. And now we get to have um, some local music into it, too. So, you know, trying to keep ev everything, you know, as homegrown as possible is really important to us. And, and I would just give a big up to um, Solar Palm Studios because they've really made this project look great. Um, you know, I gave them a bunch of all my B-roll and all my interviews and, and they brought it together in a way that um, looks fantastic. Yeah, and they've been real creative contributors as well, not just, you know, because it's easy, it's easy for them because they're also one of our sponsors. So, so a, a big portion of this is in kind donations for them. So they're not making money off us. Uh, so they could have been easy for them to just kind of stitch what we had together and say, there you go. But, you know, they've been coming mm -hmm. with suggestions and um, contributing their own B-roll. Uh, it was them who came up with the idea and contacted and arranged with um, Stuart for the music. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. I wish I had. Uh, so they've been really <laughs> great. And along with our other project sponsors, who I have to mention, uh, Dart, Health City Cayman Islands, uh, Enterprise Cayman, Silver Palm Studios, and our media partner, Cayman Life TV. As I say, without without their support and their resources, this just wouldn't happen, wouldn't exist without them. So thank you, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Community makes it happen. Oh, that is so true. All right, awesome. All right, Kayla, thank you so much. I can't wait to see how it's turned out so far. Thank you. And um, hopefully we'll be talking with you again soon. Yes, thank you for having me on. Thanks, Kayla. Okay, so I disappeared, Kayla, now. <laughs> I'm not that great with the buttons today, Patrick, but I know there were a couple of other subjects that you kind of wanted to touch on. We've been talking over the past few weeks, I guess, month or two, um, about the Office of Education Standards and their, um, I see them as kind of check-ins, really, um, 
because they had to make some adaptations to the way that they were inspecting schools or chose to really, so as to avoid putting undue pressure on the schools. Um, there were two that you wanted to touch on today, I think John Gray and Prep. That's correct. Yeah, they're just kind of check-in wellness visits. How you doing? Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I guess this is going to be the positive um, news episode of EdBeat because uh, John Gray and came, came in prep, which are two, I picked them because, you know, John Gray is the largest uh, public school in Cayman and came in prep is one of, if not the largest school in Cayman, I'd have to check attendance, but you know, they're, they're two of our largest schools, uh, longstanding, well-known. Uh, so inspectors feedback on John Gray was um, they've largely, they've largely been able to mitigate uh, the negative consequences of COVID on student learning progress and the mental well-being of students and staff. Um, that's not to say that COVID hasn't had its impact. For example, the pandemic has delayed openings of portions of the new campus, and that was kind of a new uh, item for me. Um, some, some of the tidbits from the report that I thought were interesting was this quote that um, all staff at John Gray, all staff referred to their school community as a family. Um, so that really shows this, this level of cohesiveness um, that they've built upon and had to draw upon during, you know, these stressful times, which is which are impacting every school and probably almost every business on the island. Um, something that they did last summer was at John Gray, they held a summer catch up camp um, to try to close these learning gaps before they got any bigger. And so the, the inspector said that translated to a solid start uh, for the to the school year as uh, measured by baseline assessments that they did at the beginning of the year. So it looks like the summer camp strategy um, paid off for them. Uh, and another thing is, and I didn't know this, I don't know a lot of things, is John Gray has three school counselors and they also have an educational psychologist, I believe three days out of the week. Um, so they have a pretty robust um, support system in place for um, students' mental wellness, uh, but still because of the increase in demand uh, and anxiety and stress on the students. Sometimes even that team wasn't enough at all times to meet the demand from the students. So, you know, it's not, um, it's not all roses and it's, a, it's, a, it's not a great situation that the pandemic is uh, putting on all schools, but these are things that John Gray's doing to um, have successes in spite of the challenges. And similarly, moving on to prep, uh, what, so they, they've done a really good job as well in terms of um, minimizing learning gaps, if any, uh, monitoring and supporting um, students' mental well-being and staff. Uh, but what really stood out for me at PrEP is um, this focus on strategic planning and, and not just planning for how to deal with the pandemic, but being able to um, handle the day-to-day, -day, but also continue doing kind of the big picture thinking. Uh, which is something that I, th I, I think we talked about that not all schools are able to do right now. Yeah, we, we did. We discussed the challenge of um, looking ahead long term while dealing with all of the, the tension and chaos of things like COVID, you know, LFT tests, incorporating them into yeah. your system and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so at PrEP, the, the, the board and the school administration, they've, the Board of Governors, uh, they, they've started putting together a strategic 10-year plan. Uh, which is, you know, of course, a, a long, a long-term plan for an organization. And one of the highlights that the inspectors brought out is um, they've already started to look at how to incorporate um, student input into that planning process. And that's one of the um, key stakeholder groups in educational institutions that historically are kind of the last to be allowed a place at the table is the students. They let the, the parents and the faculty and the admin and the board of governors, and then oh wait, uh, you know, come on, come on, Susie and Johnny, come to the table. Uh, so they've 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 started that, which I think is um is an important thing to um, acknowledge and consider. Uh, in addition to the strategic planning at prep, and this is something I've seen um, as kind of a uh, I don't want to say common, but it's it's one of the emerging successes of the pandemic is um, using technology and just kind of awareness to enhance communications. So when you're forced with a situation, um, specifically with parents, where parents aren't on the school or in the school or around the school as much as they used to be, 
uh, there's been a conscious effort to reach out to them through virtual platforms and by doing remote uh, remote conversations instead of the typical uh, parent-teacher conference and um, using newsletters and WhatsApp and everything that you can schools are throwing out. So, so at PrEP, they, they've reported a, a strengthening in the depth and meaningfulness of communication between the school and the parents. Um, and, that, and that's, again, that's something I've seen in a few schools here. And that's something that people want to um, learn from and take, take away uh, going forward. Uh, uh, PrEP's also done a good job with regular uh, staff meetings to, um, you know, keep, keep tabs on each other and keep tabs on how the students are feeling. And um, the teachers, of course, are using virtual platforms to, like, uh, I think Teams and Seesaw, you know, things like this, to keep track, uh, to be able so that the students can ask them questions and have face-to-face, -face, even if they don't happen to be at school. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, at PrEP, as with many schools, they'll say, you know, this is all great, but especially with the students, we still miss the, the kind of informal, casual, one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. physical communications that do happen. Um, so I don't, think, I don't think anybody wants to keep things uh, the way they were, <laughs> uh, you know, a few months ago, and they don't, they don't want to keep the status quo now. But I think, um, you know, we can come out of COVID having learned a lot, a lot of useful, uh, with a lot, you know, better, uh, better adept at a lot of useful tools that people had to use um, during the pandemic. That makes, uh, you know, a great deal of sense, because if you, as I weigh in on your, <laughs> on your knowledge, but it does make a great deal of sense. There is something a bit isolating, even with the interactive nature of some of the remote communication. I mean, as some classes, um, and I've saw it through two different school, the perspective of two different schools, but um, some classes were more easily managed um, you know, in a remote way in, in, for a short period of time. But as that extended, um, people started to get a little bit disconnected from each other. Um, and the, um, the other thing is that not all parents uh, consume communi the communication from the school in the same way. So um, for some reading a six paragraph email may be too difficult for them, but the quick um, WhatsApp blast from the parent group is you know easier to do or vice versa. Um, having the schools you know utilize and, and basically experiment with different strategies and different, different tactics and approaches um, is more likely to lead to them having a better understanding of what's going to work in the future. Um, plus, we do need to be comfortable with technology. We're, we use it all the time anyway, but I think some some cases the schools I'm seeing use it in a uh, smarter fashion than in the past. I think. They, we had no choice but to try new things. And I think some of those were seeing the success of that. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, what I'm seeing in these reports is um, accounts of individual staff who were more tech savvy uh, or who were more ready to embrace it. Um, they've had successes when they've empowered the tech savvy staff to go ahead and lead their colleagues on how to do it. So it's kind of this um, peer leadership, which, which is important because I know like it's a lot different having an IT person, you know, come and tell you all the things that you can do and blah, blah, blah. And, and as opposed to somebody who's doing the same job as you go, hey, actually, I, I use it this way and this is how it works for me. So you can really have a better connection uh, sometimes that way. Less intimidating, if you will. <laughs> well, and also relevant, like this person's going to tell you 20 things it could do. Here's two things it does. Yeah. <laughs> this will actually make your life easier. And sometimes you just, all you need is just that one thing that you can manage that will help improve the, your ability to teach or connect or share. And I, and I had seen some very different styles in how the technology is being used. My fear was that once everything was over though, that we'd go to the other extreme because we were so grateful to, <laughs> to be able to be in person again. Yeah. But there are some, you know, there, sometimes there's a wave of illness that goes through a school doesn't mean that you can't still do bring you know bring students in remotely for example sometimes so I think um, I mean we're not out of the water just yet but things are certainly have changed direction than where they were a year ago um, even six months ago for yep. that matter I don't think we're going back to slates and primers abacus <laughs> yard sticks well meter stick meter stick 
<laughs> Although ours had both, so just so you know, Patrick. Anyway, um, that about wraps us up for this week. Patrick, anything you want to sort of tease to what's um, ahead and came in current? No, we're really looking forward. We're really looking ahead to Friday evening's um, debut. So kind of focused on um, doing the final polish on the episode, um, making sure the sponsor's logos look great. And, um, you know, uh, helping, you know, Kayla needs any uh, last minute assistance um, with what she needs to prepare and coordinating with the festival organizers to make sure that, you know, we've tied our shoes properly, things like that. <laughs> That's always important. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, the shoe tying note that is. Um, thanks so much for joining us, everybody, for EdMeet this week. And we look forward to hearing, 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 sharing more with you. But hearing from you is pretty good, too. Um, to do that, you've got to visit kmancurrent.org or Kman Life TV, And we will be happy to engage in discussion about education with you. And also, whatever you're interested in us talking about, we just might incorporate that in an upcoming episode. Have a good one, everybody. <laughs>